Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy, Coach Landon. Welcome to the first episode of Beyond Tomorrow Recruiting. Today, we have a really special guest, a good friend of mine, somebody that I've had the pleasure of getting to know on a coaching level over the last few months. I'm going to let him introduce himself. Check it out. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy, Coach Landon. We are here with the first episode of Beyond Tomorrow Recruiting for the Coach Landon YouTube channel. Today, we have a really, really special guest. Not only is he the first guest for the interview segment, but he's also a really good guy, a guy that I've gotten to know a little bit over the last few months through coaching on the Utah Gold Adidas circuit. And uh, I'm going to let him go ahead and introduce himself, and then we'll get into a couple questions. So first off, thanks, Landon. I appreciate you having me on the show. Um, my name is Coach Kitchen. I am an assistant coach at Snow College, a uh, junior college in Ephraim, Utah, about an hour south of Provo. Um, this is my second year at Snow College. I, uh, before I was here, I was a grad assistant at BYU. And... Prior to that, I was a player and a walk-on and a manager, all of them, at Utah Valley. So I'm happy to be here, excited to be on the show, and uh, let's, let's dive into it. Perfect. Thanks, man. I appreciate you taking the time out for this. Um, so first, let's talk a little bit about how you got to Snow College. Sure. Um, you know, when I kind of started getting into the coaching world, I never really thought of junior college as an option. Um, and so I was surprised by um, kind of what JC has to offer. So, um, you know, after I got done playing basketball in high school, um, I served an LDS mission. Uh, three weeks after graduation, I left and I was in Africa for two years in Mozambique. Um, I loved my time there. Um, but a lot of LDS uh, basketball players, when they go to serve missions, unless they have like a, you know, a spot set, like, hey, this is where I'm going. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty when you come back. Um, when I got home from my mission, I ultimately chose instead, I had a couple options at some smaller schools and stuff. And I ultimately chose that, hey, you know what, basketball is probably um, not it for me, which was stupid, um, as you, you'll find out later. But uh, anyway, so I ended up just going to Utah Valley to do my, uh, to, you know, start my education. I wanted to do something that, with math and engineering. Um, and so I coached a high school team for two years right after I got home from my mission, uh, Salem Hills. Um, I fell in love with it. My dad was a, my dad was a high school basketball coach. Um, and so like, I always thought like coaching would be fun as a hobby. Um, never really something I thought I could do, um, you know, full-time as a job, as a career. Um, but I really fell in love those first two years at Salem Hills. Um, and I'd get, I'd get parents and other coaches asking me, you know, like, Hey, you're really young. Like, is this something you want to do? And I was just like, well, there's really no money in, in high school coaching. And I don't think I have any way of getting into the world of college basketball. And so like, I just always kind of said, like, it's not what I want to do with my life, but like, I think I'll always want to coach. Um, Anyways, fast forward, I got an opportunity at Utah Valley um, to be a head manager. And um, it was really weird because the two the two guys at Utah Valley that were um, kind of their, their two managers at the time, um, I'd got to know just going to school, um, playing pickup ball with them. Just they knew that I was coaching high school basketball, but um, one of them, I, it was really funny. They, I was actually uh, watching a movie um, like the new Avengers had come out and I had missed a call from him. And, um, I called him back and he was like, Hey, like me and this other guy, we're both graduating Utah, uh, like you've used men's basketball teams looking for a head manager. I know you coached in high school and, um, you know, if there's any, if you had any sort of desire to kind of see and look down that path and chase that like dream like this would be a good opportunity if you if you ever wanted to like have college be an open like an open opportunity and so um I thought about it for about all of five minutes and I was like yeah I want to do that that sounds great um and it was it was funny because I was working part-time at a 
at a like a lumber estimating uh place and it was uh, i mean it was a good job it paid well it was worked good with my schedule and stuff like that and i quit it like two days later and i started working at utah valley for free for the summer and um that was one of the one of the first things that like i will say about coaching is most of the coaches started essentially what what i did like working for free um and so like players I will just say like have have some compassion because a lot of these guys that are trying to get into the coaching world they're doing it because they love it um not because there's a lot of money and I will say that that is like number one like have some compassion towards your coaches because like we're trying our best and we're trying to make ends meet and a lot of times like when you're first starting out like you're getting you're either working for free or you're getting paid very very little Mm -hmm. um but anyway, so I, I quit my job. I started working at Utah Valley and I kind of was just like, hey, I'm going to see where this takes takes me. Um, so I was a manager. Um, my It was my fourth year at UVU because my program took five years to do. And um, so I worked for Coach Pope and his staff um, their last year at Utah Valley. Um, and then after the season, Coach Pope ended up getting the job at BYU and um I ended up staying at Utah Valley for coach Madsen's first year. And he, uh, we, like I would play pickup with our guys in the summer when they need an extra body. Um, I was just kind of always there kind of that like annoying little brother that just like was always around you and you never, you know, you always wanted him to leave, but I just was there because I, I had kind of been trained that like the best thing I can do is just be available Um, as a, as a manager, like, Hey, if a guy needs to get shots up, stuff like that, if coach needs me to run an errand for him, whatever it is, like I'm just there. And so um, when our guys would play um, that summer, a lot of times for some reason we had nine guys, like we'd always have nine guys like Brad, we need to play. And obviously I'd played in high school and, you know, I'd worked really hard to, you know, be a decent basketball player and coach Madsen, um, he watched us play one time and he was just like, Brad, why don't you like play? I think you're good enough to be a walk-on. Do you want to be a walk-on? And at the time I was just like, you know, like being a walk-on is great and all and all that stuff but like I was on scholarship as a manager um school was getting paid for that was really important for me and so I just I was like I don't think it's the right thing for me and then he asked me again and I told him no again and um my teammates at the time kind of caught wind that I had been telling coach no and they all kind of lovingly said how stupid I was to not take the opportunity you know to kind of like live out a dream that I always had to play college basketball so um, I, I went back to coach Madsen and I was like, Hey, you know what? I think I'll take you up on that, uh, on that opportunity. Um, so I walked on, um, was a really good experience for me. Um, we, we struggled that first year, um, as a, as a team overall, but there was a lot of things that I was able to learn. A lot of things that helped me, um, even this year, uh, being my first year as a coach, like seeing kind of like how to, um, rally like a team behind a cause and stuff like things that maybe didn't go well for me when I was a walk-on and like seeing like the struggles of a first-year coach I was able to kind of like lean from those those like little perspectives and um, ultimately um, helped me a lot but anyways I kind of got sidetracked Um, so after I got finished at UVU I took a grad assistant spot at BYU with coach Pope so I, I worked for the same staff for three years um, one at UVU and then two at BYU. Um, when I finished my time at BYU, um, this was probably the hardest part of, um, like coaching is getting that first job, like being a grad assistant. Okay. That, that was a, that was a tough hurdle. Like finding that opportunity, being a manager, like those things were tough hurdles, but like, this was like the first real hurdle of like, okay, I'm done with my schooling. Like, where do I go? And how do I get there? And I was really great or like, I was really grateful to have a bunch of people in my corner that were connected. Um, Chris Burgess, that's up at the university of Utah, Nick Robinson, Cody Feger, like the assistants that I worked for at BYU really rallied behind me in the, the, an opening spot um, at snow college, as well as um, Travis Hansen, who's a good friend of mine. He, he was able to make, some of the things work financially with working with another AAU team. Um, And like, so I had a lot of people in my life that were able to help get me to the spot at snow college 
Um, and then from there, it was just like, okay, now I'm with Coach May. Um, how do we make this thing work? How do we, you know, like, how are we going to build a program so that we can compete night in and night out and try to, you know, win our region, um, you know, or win our conference, win our region, and then hopefully make it to the national champion or national tournament again. So um, that's kind of my story of how I got to snow. Um, and, and I'm sure we'll jump into some more of the the details and stuff of that, of what it, what it's like. So. So you have been on both sides, obviously, which is really cool. The four year side, you're currently on the two year side. So having experienced both sides of that, what would you say are three of the bigger differences, adjustments, you can go pros and cons of, of Juco ball versus four year. We'll have a lot of kids from social media that'll watch this video and they, you know, in, in every kid's mind, they want to be a four year kid. They want to, you know, come out of high school, go D1, D2, you know, play four years. And then the Juco route kind of becomes the second thought. So, um, kind of give a little bit of insight from the coaching perspective on the difference between that two year experience and that four year experience. Sure. Um, so, I mean, first off, um, this is our, this is my experience. Okay. Um, everyone's going to have different experiences. And so like, I don't want anyone to take this as gospel, but this is, this is how I view it and kind of how we see it at Snow College. So advantages of two-year schools. Number one is we play freshmen and sophomores, right? That is our roster. So we have to play them. Um, Four-year schools, like right now, if you see the trend in college basketball, like everyone talks about the transfer portal. Well, the transfer portal is all about getting older, right? You get guys that play, that produced at lower levels that are looking for their junior and senior and fifth years. Like all those, all those guys are now like, getting the high major stuff right because they've produced at a certain level and they're trying to play so like if you look at a lot of rosters like we're talking a lot of upperclassmen um not saying that it's impossible to play like freshmen and sophomores i mean utah valley this year played a freshman pretty consistently all year byu played two utah um i don't think utah did actually play i mean they played uh yeah they played a freshman pretty consistently um, so like, I mean, there are, there are high level programs that do play freshmen, but I would say the majority like of their players and their, their key contributors are juniors and seniors. And so, um, I would say that's the number one advantage for JC is you get an opportunity in those freshman and sophomore years to make a lot of these mistakes, to have that leash where like, if, if you go into a D one program, and you're a freshman and you're turning the ball over, guess what? They've got a senior vet. He might not be able to do everything that you can do, but like, he's not going to turn the ball over. And that's going to be like, that's going to piss off a coach if you're turning the ball over. So he's like, fine, I'll just play the senior guy. I know he doesn't score as much, but he's not going to turn the ball over. Right. So like, um, I would say that's number one is like the availability or the opportunity to play and to play right away and make mistakes. I'd say that's like the first advantage. Um, one of the advantages of a four year is the like, I mean, I think every four year probably is better financially and like facilities and, um, you know, kind of the funding that keeps the program going like those things are better. Um, Division one schools, they have 13 full ride scholarships, a lot of JCs, um, they might have they might only have tuition waivers like we're fortunate enough at Snow College that we have in some way, shape or form, like scholarships to give to players, whether that's tuition, housing, food, stuff like that. Um, some schools in our conference, they can't even give like, all they can give is like a tuition waiver. So like in JC, there's a lot of, you know, um, variance in like the amount of funding that you can get that you can give players where like D1, all if you're if you're a scholarship guy, it doesn't matter if you're the 13th guy or the best player, your scholarship looks the same. Um, and so there's that, uh, another disadvantage of JC right now is like with NIL. Um, a lot of these division one schools are figuring out how to pay their players. Um, JC, we don't really get that. Right. I mean, I think CSI had one guy last year that had like a burger at a restaurant or something like, so he had an NIL deal. Um, but like, it's not what 
division one schools are. So like, if you're looking to, to get a bag, as the kids would say, like JC's not the, the, the spot for you, but where like JC is, uh, where it has its advantages is you get to play when you're young and grow and develop. And it's really funny because what happens is like high school teammates, one will go D one and one will go JC. And the guy that goes JC gets to play and develop. And he like ends up passing the guy that's D one. Right. And so like, um, like we were talking about this the other day with some, some high school coaches and like one of the high school coaches, he's like, Hey, I'm all in on that. Cause like, I've seen my guys go D one and not play a lick. And then they end up going to JC anyways. Cause they're just like, I want to play. Right. I want to play. And so, um, so that's probably the biggest one. Other advantages of JC, um, like snow college, we're a pretty high academic school. And so, one of the advantages is like we can work towards um, your degree. Like, I mean, every JC does that, but one of the nice things is when you're getting recruited and stuff to go play at the next level. Um, a lot of guys, what they do is once they've committed to play at, let's say school X, like our academic advisors, they basically tailor the rest of their schedule to start taking, like essentially take classes at the school that they're going to. So they actually get ahead um, and so like, that's a big advantage where maybe kids aren't really sure what they want to do, uh, academically, or if they do know what they want to do academically, um, JC kind of gives them that freedom to either just chase like a general and like take classes that are maybe not as crazy hard at a university. Um, and then like, Hey, once they've decided where they're going, they, they can start taking classes. Um, and then I would say a third advantage of JC would have to be like, hmm, this is a tough one. Cause there's, I mean, there, we, when we're recruiting kids, like we're trying to, you know, uh, program. Well, yeah, as, as I was gonna say, cause like every JC is different. Um, and I, I think that might be one of the, the advantages of like JC's like you can find like a spot where you can be successful. Yeah. Um, I think that's one of the, and this will probably be something that we, we touch even more, but like, um, because there's so many junior colleges and opportunities, like there's so many coaches and so many play styles. So like, yeah, you might be set on like, Hey, I want to go to this school, but like, maybe it just doesn't fit your play style. Right. And th this is something we'll probably dive in deeper, but like go where you're wanted. And a lot of times like JC's are the ones that want you really, really bad because they're like, Hey, we know you can play. And we're going to like, we're going to like kind of not sell a farm, but like, we're going to really make it work for you. We're like, if you go to D1 or you go D2, like you just kind of become another cog in the machine, which isn't a bad thing. And like basketball is a team sport. And I, like, I, I was a walk on, like I selflessly gave up everything that I could to like make it work. And like, I understand that, but like when you're thinking about being a college basketball player, like go where you were wanted. And you will have, you'll have all the success and all the fun that you're looking for, because like, it's part of the sales pitch to get you there is like, they want you, they believe in you. And like confidence is so big that it's going to like translate into everything that you do. Yeah. So I'd say those three things, your playing time, like the ability to kind of find a spot like the is your play style and i think academically it's a really smart choice for guys that maybe don't really know what they're doing at the moment and they're they need some time to figure it out yeah no i agree um and that was really good i was gonna i was gonna segue that into the the next portion of like advice for class of 24 guys coming out i definitely think a very very big part of that is the piece where you said go where you're wanted a lot of kids get excited just for the opportunity to play at the next level. But if it's not a good fit, if the coaching style doesn't fit you, if, if you take tough coaching, you know, if you're hard on yourself and then if the coach comes down on you, you kind of shut down, but that tough coach is the first coach that showed interest in you. That might not be the best fit for you. So um, what would be like some of the advice that you would give outside of going where you want it? to class of 24 guys that'll be seniors this year looking to play at the next level um i would so, so yeah obviously go where you you're wanted but number two is like when you have when you sit down with the coaches first off what's the head coach saying 
right? I'm an assistant coach. I, my job is to find people and to essentially convince coach may that, Hey, this guy can play. This guy is good enough to play for us. Um, we watch a lot of film. We watch, you know, we, we try to go see him live, all those things. But what number, like number one is what is the head coach saying to the recruit, right? Assistant coach at the end of the day, like I can't offer anyone, right? It's not my program to offer people. And so I think that's one of the things like listening to what the head coach is telling you. If you haven't talked to the head coach once ever, like, I mean, it means the assistant believes in you. And if the assistant ever gets a head job, like, yeah, he'll, he'll probably offer you because he really likes you. Um, and that's probably one of the harder things for these, these kids to understand is like, Hey, I've got a really good relationship with an assistant, which is important. Like when you get here, um, like all of our players, like I have, I probably have a better and coach may would probably agree. I have a better relationship with all of our players just because I'm not the head coach. If they're frustrated with something, like things aren't going their way. They come to me. They don't go to coach may very often. Now some do, but I would say the majority of the players like have a better relationship with their assistant. So, um, which is fine. It's an important part, but like, if you're getting recruited, it's like, what is the head coach saying? And then number two is like, when you're in those conversations, what is their vision for you? Okay. Like some, some, some coaches, like their sales pitch is like, Hey, you're going to come here and you're going to compete and you're going to be part of our program and stuff like this. And it's very like general is very vague. And then some coaches are like, Hey, this is X, Y, and Z where we think you can really help impact the game and help us in a way. And here are things that like, we know that you struggle with and like are things you're going to have to um, get better at so that you can play. Um, I think that that's another part to the the whole recruiting, especially for like any upcoming class is when you're trying to make a decision of where you're going, when you have these offers is like, okay, where, like, how does this coaching staff envision me impacting the game am i a role player am i the dude um and i'll be honest most kids coming out of high school need to recalibrate and be like hey i'm going to be a role player my first year as i figure things out as i get adjusted to the speed of the game to the physicality of the game um and then that next year they take a leap and then they're kind of the the top dogs right the alphas on the team alphas on the court and i think that's one of the other things that could be advice for the class of like 24 is like, Hey, you're like, you're coming from being the the big dog in a small pond. And now you're going to just be another one of the dudes. And like, what, what, where's your work ethic at? Um, you know, and have some patience because the, the game at the next level is completely different. High school and college basketball are two completely different games. Yeah. Um, so that would be another, another piece of advice that I would give like kids that are going, whether it's D1, JUCO, D2, D3, NAI, wherever you end up going, like understand that you're playing against people that, um, have been in your shoes and they know how to like take everything from you. So like be patient and continue to grind, continue to work. And like those things will, will work out in the end. Definitely. Definitely. The, uh, Obviously, as an assistant, you probably get the first look at players before coach takes a look at them and then, you know, recruiting visits, all that fun stuff. Um, from a coaching standpoint, as far as like recruiting, social media presence, highlight videos, kind of touch on just on a super high level, but what really stands out positive or not necessarily positive on like, oh, I like, I like what I see in this short snippet, this little intro. I want to watch a game film. I want to go watch yeah. this kid play. Like, what are some of those things for you specifically that kind of, you know, trigger that light bulb or, or flick that switch that make you interested in a kid separating themselves from the hundreds of kids that want to play at snow? Sure. Um, well, first off, to touch on like the social media presence, and then we'll jump into like more of the things that I kind of focus on um, for all these kids. And I think the the rising generation maybe does a little bit better job of this, of having a little bit more like tact when it comes to what they put on social media. I'll just say this as a coach, like if you're posting stupid stuff on social media, 
it's going to make us less and less likely to want to recruit you. Right. Um, and I'm not saying like you being a dork with your friends and doing stupid things that teenagers do. I'm saying like stuff that can get you into trouble in the future. Um, just like, we want you to be yourself and authentic and all that, but like also be smart and don't post stupid stuff. Don't post illegal stuff. Um, don't post, you know, I would, I, we always tell our players like, anything you put out there, like it's for the world. So like, if you're going to be super politically charged and everything you say, like people are going to know that and they're going to come after you for it because you are, you are now like a public figure. Um, so I would say things that we, when we're going to recruit, um, every coach is going to be different, right? Things that um, coach may really likes in players. I don't necessarily like in players and vice versa. Right. Um, and so it's like, ultimately it is my job to find players that coach may likes find guys that um, would fit what he's trying to do. And like, there are some things that like kind of overlap. Right. Um, but like, ultimately we love people that have high IQs, right. Um, skilled players is probably like, I mean, any coach will probably say like, I want skilled players, right. People that can do the skills of basketball at a high level, whether that's dribble, pass, shoot, any of those skills at a high level. Um, for me personally, I would say the number one thing, and it's the hardest thing to equate is toughness. Like I look for people that are tough. Um, and toughness can take many forms. Um, does the guy like guard number one, like, can he guard the ball? If he can't guard his man, like, I'm sorry, you're not going to play. And that makes it really easy for us to be like, yeah, I mean, like you're a skilled basketball player, but like you can't guard. And at the next level, if you can't guard the opposing coach, it's his job to find the, the, the weak link and he's going to attack you play after play after play until we either sub you off or they win by 50 and we're not going to lose by 50. So we're going to sub you off. Um, but like for me, toughness. So like defense, do they like talk? I think one of the things like that uh, about mental toughness is like your ability to, when you're tired, can you continue to like communicate to your teammates? Um, it's not easy. Um, and so like when we go watch a high school game, if a kid, if some kids like, constantly talking and it's not just because hey coach is here and he knows I like he likes when people talk but like it's part of a habit and they've like developed it over their their whole life as playing from little kid all the way up into high school like that's big for me um rebound like can they rebound right being tough means like I'm gonna box out the biggest dude on the court and maybe I don't get the rebound but like I'm I'm gonna hit that dude and move him so my teammate can get the rebound like that's a tough player um do they do they like are they a help defender you know all like all the things that are toughness like do they get on the floor will they take a charge like those are things that I value personally and I would like I'd rather take a little bit less of a skilled player but he's like tough as nails I'm taking that dude over a guy that's skilled but you know doesn't like he's just not tough right because at the end of the game like when we need to play when we need to make a winning play like my tough players are the guys that are in like, and we, that's something that this year we learned really quick is like, we're going to play the guys that are making plays in the game. And sometimes like we benched some of our starters for the whole second half of the game. And we win because like the guys we had out there were just tougher. Right. Um, and so that was like, a, that was a huge part for us is like, and we will continue to do is just recruiting tough players. Like, Hey, they are tough. I want to recruit them. Um, all like the other skills, yes, they're important. But like for me personally, like it is tough. And then I would say kind of maybe the flip side is like someone that's entitled probably ain't going to make it very far in college basketball, not just with our staff, but like in general, like having a, a, a sense of humility. Because you got to understand, like a lot of these coaches that you're going to go play for, they started out, like I said, not making any money, right? They have zero entitlement. They have fought for every last bit that they've gotten. And so like, for them to then like flip around and go just recruit a player that's entitled that believes that they, they deserve the world and this, that, and the other, like, no, that's not going to fly. Right. So like having some humility, understanding that like, you're going to have to work for everything and every day you're going to have to like prove that you deserve what you're given. And like those, those things really stand out as we like recruit players, like, you know, how he treats his teammates, how he treats his coaches, how he treats his parents, how he's, 
treats just random strangers. Like we watch those things just to like, make sure like we're getting a good kid. Right. And so those are probably some of the things that um, stand out for us. Um, and then like, obviously with, with like film that we're sent, like, here's the thing. Everyone's got a great highlight tape. You can, you can make yourself a great highlight basketball player. Um, things that like the, showing that you have a high IQ and like, you're able to see the court, make plays, you can make shots, you're highly skilled. Like those are just like, those need to be like step one. Like we got to be able to see that you can do those things. And then we'll be interested and we'll, we'll start diving in deeper to who you are as a player, as a person um, and try to really figure out, are you going to be a good fit for us? And if not, like, it's no, it's no like bad blood between us. It's just, Hey, we, we know what we want. We know what we're looking for and you don't fit the bill. Yeah. I always tell players, especially my high school guys that the toughness doesn't show up in the stat sheet, but it shows up at the final score. And so, yeah. you know, the, I think we're in a society today where the highlight films and the bag and the, you know, the ball is life and all of that stuff have kind of not necessarily infested the culture, but had such a big impact that the guys that put in that work that doesn't show up on a stat sheet are the guys that create that separation between them and their, their competition, their peers and, and other kids in their class that they're going to be, you know, competing for spots with. Um, I read a really cool article that said it was something like 12. It was, it was either seven, seven or 12 percent of high school athletes go on to play at the next level and so like it's a lot of competition coast to coast so yeah the more the more those kids know coming into that process i think the better off they're going to be mm -hmm. for sure well uh hey man i do i really really appreciate you taking time um i know we got up early i don't know if it's early for you i'm not a morning guy so it's kind of early for me, but I've already gotten up and gotten a good little sweat in today. So, you know, I do appreciate your time again. Um, anything, any last minute things you want to say or, or anything heading out? Um, I would just say like having, having been in their shoes, right. As a high school basketball player that maybe didn't have a lot of options coming out of high school. Um, if you really love basketball and you really are, like invested in it and you want to see where it can take you um be humble and don't run away from any opportunity um i think one that's one of the things that a lot of kids um kind of get discouraged about is well i'm not getting recruited by school x y and z like if i if i can't go there then i'm just not going to play basketball and it's like okay like if that's really the if that's really what you're worried about then like clearly basketball isn't like something that you love like if you love something you're willing to do it for free you're willing to pay for it you're willing to like do whatever it takes to make it happen and so I would just say like be humble be grateful and gracious for any of the opportunities that you're given to play at the next level because at the end of the day like those coaches it's their livelihood bringing you on right if I take Johnny and he lose and we lose games, I lose my job and me and my family have to move and go somewhere else. Right. Like those, like it, it, it starts to become a reality at the next level because like the, your high school coaches, they were doing it because they love it. And they're someone in the community that wants to give back and do that. Like the next level, it's their livelihood. Right. And so um, be humble, be grateful. And I would just say, go where you're wanted right um ultimately at the end of the day your success and your experience is going to be so much better if you go where you're wanted if you're like trying to if you're trying to be like pushing your way into a spot i mean it's one in a a million of a guy that like forces his way onto a team and then ends up being like the dude right ultimately like the coaches are going to it it's just how it is right they want the guys that they want they recruit really hard and then like they're going to play those guys because they recruited them and they invested all this time. So like, I would just say, go where you're wanted, be humble, be grateful and enjoy this experience. Cause it's the only time you get to like focus on basketball for the rest of your life. So there you go. 
Well, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Everybody, I will I will post Coach Brad's Twitter handle in the comments. Follow him. Really, 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 really good content. He does a lot of stuff for the young players. And uh, Brad, thanks again, man. I appreciate your time. No, thank you so much. It was a lot of fun. Take care.